And then as I, w I want to open up God's word to you this morning, um, chapter 8 in, in the Gospel of John is really, uh, I'll just throw this out. I rarely have uh, a couple of key words in here, but I'm going to say there are five contrasts. And I'm going to just spell out four of them really quickly. He starts out, remember, it's the woman taken in the act of adultery. And then they want to stone her. And they said, well, the law says this. And so the contrast, and I'll make it kind of simple for you. It's law versus grace. The law says we need to stone her. But grace says, oh, it's so amazing that I will forgive you. You've repented of your sins. You know that you're exposed. And so it was law versus grace. Pastor Caleb, uh, a week ago, gave us that wonderful statement in, in John chapter 8, verse 12, where Jesus said, I am the light of the world. But even though he's the light of the world, men love what? Men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. So in the first part of, the, of chapter 8, it's law versus grace. In the second little portion, it's light versus darkness. In the portion that we start into today, he's into life versus death. It's kind of easy if you watch most of them, they unfold with the letter L. Law versus grace. Light versus darkness. Life versus death. Because he says to them, unless they believe, unless they choose belief, they will die in their sin. It's interesting that he uses the singular word the first time. And then by the time you get to verse 24, he says, like I told you, you will die in your sins. Because sin is the nature that we have. Sins are what we do because we have that sin nature. As he moves on uh, to the probably the most famous verse in John 8. In John 8, 32, it says, And you will know the truth, and the truth will set you what? Free. So in this section of scripture, he has this liberty. You're going to be free. You're going to be set free. You'll have liberty versus slavery. You're not enslaved to sin anymore. And so let me just now turn and, and share with you. March 3rd, it's kind of easy to date for me to remember because it's Deanne's birthday. But March 3rd this year in the United Kingdom, in the area of England, a man, a young man, 38 years of age, his name is Riza uh, Kaka, Karka. He's a Uranian. And in Iran, where he grew up, he trusted Christ. And when you trust Christ in Iran, it's punishable by death. So he fled Iran, went to the United Kingdom, and he's been there since 2003. You think, wow, he's been there long enough, it's not going to be a problem. But this year, there was a, a, a hearing, an immigration hearing, where he's finally going to get the chance to maybe <clears throat> be a, a citizen in, in the United Kingdom. And not be deported. Oh my goodness, can you imagine that? Being deported back to Iran where he's going to face what? Execution. As he went before the judge on this immigration uh, hearing, the judge said, are, are you uh, sure that you're a Christian? How do we know that you haven't just done this to make immigration status possible and to say, oh, you know, if I go back there, I'll be executed. So you know what the judge did? With Riza Karka, he said, I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you a Bible 
test. After all, if you claim to be a Christian, you ought to know some of the word of God. He failed the test. He couldn't remember, and he didn't just miss this one area, but he couldn't remember that it was Judas who betrayed Jesus. And so it is still in the process today of him being deported back to Iran unless something happens. You know, I'm just wondering in my own heart, and I'm wanting you to wonder in your heart, if you had to take that test, by the way, it was 150 questions. It wasn't just, hey, let me give you one question here. Out of 150 questions, if you had to take that test, would there be enough evidence to convict you of being a Christian? You know what's interesting? The, if you claim to be a disciple of Christ, there ought to be some evidence in your life. Did you know that in the Gospel of John, the word disciple or disciples occurs 79 times. It occurs in 17 of the 21 chapters. Guess what he's interested in? If you're going to claim to be a believer, then you're going to be a what? A disciple of Christ. A mathy taste or a mathy tone. Someone who is going to count the cost, lay down their life, put your hands to the plow, and never do what? Never look back. When it comes to today's passage in John chapter 8, verses 21, all the way up to maybe 35, he uses the word disciple again. And it comes up in verse 31. Here's what it says. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, if you continue in my word, you really are my, what's the next word? Disciples. So he's going to give in this passage some evidence, some marks of being a disciple. Let me ask you this. What are the marks that the Lord is looking to have in your life? What are the indications that he looks at you and says, you're my disciple? The marks in the text, and I want to take you to verse 31, but let me give you the first mark. Discipleship begins with faith. F-A-I-T-H. And I don't mean that building over there or our church, but where you trust Christ and you pour out your faith to him and believe what he said is true. So let me say it again. Discipleship begins with faith, not family. Did you catch that? Because here's what the Jewish people were saying, especially when he said, you've been slaves and you're, you're not, I'm of my father. And they said, our father is Abraham. Because here's the family we're in. We're in this royal family. We're in God's chosen people. And he's saying, wait, it has nothing to do with family. I don't care where you were born and where you were born or whose family you were born into until you're born again, born again into God's family. John 1, he says, it's not the will of man. It wasn't a flesh. It wasn't some man's desire to say, I want to have children. You, you were born of God if you trusted Christ as your Savior. So it's something that came by faith. Let me read it to you this way, starting at verse 20. Jesus spoke these words by the treasury while teaching in the temple complex. 
but no one seized him because his hour had not yet come. Then he said to them again, I'm going away. You will look for me and you will die in your sin. Where I'm going, you cannot come. So the Jews said again, he won't kill himself, will he? Since he says, where I'm going, you cannot come. They thought, unbelievable. Is he going to commit suicide here? No. But he says, where I'm going, you cannot come. You are from below, he told them. I am from above. You are of this world. I am not of this world. Therefore, I told you, you will die in your sins. For if you, here it is. What does discipleship begin with? For if you do not believe that I am he, the Messiah, you will die in your sins. So what does this start? What's the first mark of being a disciple? Or you believe. <clears throat> he goes on in verse 31. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed him. So it's going to start with belief. Pestuo, where you, without seeing, believe. I doubt that you've ever heard of Dr. Gordon Allis, A-L-L-E-S, Dr. Gordon Allis. He was born in 1901. He's obviously since passed away. But you know what he discovered? He was a chemist. And he was attempting to give, get a drug or some kind of medicine that would cure asthma. He was working on it, working on it, and then they, they started to dose people, D-O-S-E, dose people. They put doses of that medicine in. And do you know what it used to be? You know who used to be one of the first to be dosed? with a medicine? The doctor. Do you understand what I'm saying? <clears throat> the doctor, if they're going to be dosed, they better what? They better believe that what they put out really is going to work. You know, as you, in this COVID experience, <clears throat> when they talk about you know, having some kind of medicine that is a vaccination from it, it would be interesting to line up all the doctors and say, okay, here you go. You know, you're first. You designed this. You'd have a whole lot more trust in it, wouldn't you? If they're going to put their life on the line, if they're going to say, I believe this can do something. Dr. Gordon Allis <clears throat> did the medication for asthma. Didn't I tell you that? And so he dosed. Uh, one person with it and it seemed uh, to give them kind of a euphoric feeling uh, but it didn't solve the problem. As a matter of fact, the dosage that he gave was five times what you normally give today to people because they have no idea and you know what the doctors often said? They dose themselves because now they don't rely on somebody else to tell them, you know, here's what's happening in my body. Here's what I'm feeling. Here's what it seems like. They're experiencing it. It happened to them. That's why when you tell somebody to trust Christ, you better taste and see that the Lord is good so that you can tell them what you've tasted, what you've experienced, how it changed your life. You know what happened to Dr. Alice? <clears throat> what was he trying to develop? Something that would solve asthma. You know what it ended solving? You're not going to believe this. It ended solving or creating a treatment for diabetes. So far off where he was headed, it never did anything for asthma. But it became the treatment that is still used today. And he's accredited with doing Insulin that makes things change. Did he believe? You know what's interesting? 
Dr. Gordon Ellis died at 62 years of age of diabetes. Listen to me. Having never taken the cure that he designed. You know what that says to me? Look, you can tell people that you believe, but if you don't act on it yourself, you really don't believe. And so here the Lord is saying, look, if you claim to be one of my disciples, what do I expect to see in your life? I expect to see belief. So what did I say? Discipleship begins with faith. Not any family that you were born into. But there's a second mark in this way. See, if you trusted Christ as your Savior, you should be his disciple. And there are going to be some marks on your life, in your life, that people go, they're one of the disciples. The second mark is this. Discipleship not only begins in faith, not family, but discipleship continues in the word and not works. Did you get that contrast? Here's the way it's worded in verse 31, Acts chapter, or John chapter 8, verse 31. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed him, if you continue in my word, you really are my disciples. What are they going to do? Continue where? In the word. Let me ask you this again. Reza Karkov failed his Bible test. He may have trusted Christ, but his knowledge in continuing to grow in the Lord, not continuing in the word. Let me ask you this. How much time do you spend in the word? I would think that a majority of Christians spend such a little time in the word that you would be embarrassed if people had to know how much time you read the word during the course of a week. You know, the Greek word for continue here is, is meno, M-E-N-O, meno. It's used, you've heard it many times out of John chapter 15. If in, in King James, it's translated abide. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, and it keeps going on. The Christian Standard Bible that we use says, if you remain in me and my words remain in you, you'll, you know, you'll produce what? Fruit. But it's meno. We, we often get so confused by it because meno means to abide. It means to be in somebody's house and abide there. But let me use the word remain so that you can even kind of more clearly. If you remain in God's word regularly, day in and day out, week in and week out, month in and month out, you'll be my disciple. So let me ask you this. Does your life have that mark? If not, can I challenge you to get a hunger for God's word? You ever gone fishing? I'm not much of a fisherman. As a little kid, I liked to fish. And I'd catch those little, I, we call them pumpkin seeds. They're just little, little like sunfish. What happens to a fish when it gets out of the water? You've heard that phrase again and again, haven't you? Oh man, he's like a fish out of water. What happens? What happens to a fish out of water? A fish out of water does what? Dies, right? It can be out of the water for a little period of time. But out too long, and what happens? They die. Listen to me. Here's that Greek word. Let me describe it to you. A fish needs to be in the water and remain in the water 
in order to live. That's what it means here. And how does he word it again? If you remain in my word, you really are my disciple. Do I need to say it much more powerfully than that? Listen, there are marks. You know, one mark of being a disciple, it goes back to that we're going to start with faith. And then we're going to continue in the word. The third mark, discipleship brings you to the truth. And not, can I say, and not tradition. I don't care if you've grown up in a Baptist church, a Methodist church, a Lutheran church, an Episcopalian church, you know, whatever your tradition was. Oh, we always did it that way. It was tradition. What God wants to take you to is the truth. Here's the way he words it in John 8, 31. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, if you continue in my word, you really are my disciples. You will know the truth. And the truth will set you free. It's knowing the truth. It's not some tradition. You know, I grew up in a church that at times they had standards that weren't necessarily biblical. You couldn't do certain things because, oh, you know, just people don't do that. It wasn't in the Bible, but you just don't do it because, uh, after all, that was the tradition of the church. Look, if you're going to be a disciple of Christ, you're going to come back to the truth even if it contradicts your tradition. You're going to stay with the truth, especially if it contradicts your tradition, because you're going to say, oh, the word says this. And my tradition is contrary to God's word. So if it's contrary to God's word, who wins? The word or your tradition? Is it the tradition on top or the word on top? It's the word. And you want to stay with the truth. George Barna, some of you uh, have read his surveys and reports. He's shocked at how Christians answer things. George Barna discovers that Christians aren't very grounded in what they believe. Those who claim to be born again are not necessarily firmly grounded in the truths of the Bible. In his book, which proves, or provides a statistical analysis of, analysis of religious beliefs in America, George Barna cites several fascinating statistics which are based on a national survey. Should, you, should it be surprising that Barna would receive some startling responses? Here's his question. Christians, Jews, Muslims, Buddhists, and others all pray to the same God, even though they use different names for their God. The respondents were asked to agree strongly, agree somewhat, disagree somewhat, or disagree strongly. Of that population surveyed who identified themselves as born-again Christians, 30% agreed strongly that they're praying to the same God, just a different name. 30% said that. Beyond that, 18% agreed somewhat and 12% did not know. That's a total of 60% who said that Muslims and Buddhists and Christians all pray to the same God. You know, there's only one way to God. And Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, the life. No man comes to the Father except by me, is what Jesus said. And they're not praying to the same God. There's only one God. Many Christians don't even know the truth about abortion. A majority of young people claim to be born again Christians don't even know what the Bible says about homosexuality and lesbianism. Yet God's word is clear on this. Here's what it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 and 10. Don't you know that the unrighteous will not inherit God's kingdom? Do not be deceived. No sexually immoral person, idolater, adulterers, or 
males who have sex with males will inherit the kingdom, God's kingdom. Pretty clear, isn't it? Yet, it's the young people in our country who know so little of the word of God. They're not disciples. They've grown up in a church. They claim to be Christians. They claim to be born again, but they're not. The question I have for you is, do you have the marks of a disciple today? Discipleship makes you a son and not a slave. You're not a slave to anything anymore. You shall know the truth and the truth shall set you what? Free. You ought to know that your sonship makes you in the family of God. The question I have for you today is this. If you were arrested today, as Reza Karkov has been, would there be enough evidence? Do you have the marks of a disciple so people could say, now the marks I just gave you, all out of John 8, 31 there, 32. He goes on later on in, in the latter part of the Gospel of John, and he gives the world a way to see if you're a Christian. The world a way to see if you have the marks of a disciple. And he says it this way, by this shall all, all, can I get that? By this shall all men know you are my, what? Disciples. There it is again. How are they going to know? How does the world know you're his disciple? If you love one another. Not how, how much you know the Bible, even though you're going to be in the word. You can have all that Bible stuff and still be lost. Just like Dr. Gordon Alice had all the information to treat his diabetes. But all the information up here didn't transform anything down here and he died. And here's the saddest verse I can read in the Bible. You will die in your sin. Because where, Jesus says, where I'm going, you cannot come. What does that mean? If you're a believer here today, you're going to say, oh, praise God. I, I know the Lord. I believe in him. But if you're here without him today, here's what he says to you. Where I'm going, you can't come. And you'll die in your sins because you never trusted him. Would you pray with me right now? While your heads are bowed. I know a majority of you sitting before me today have trusted Christ as your Savior. And I know you have the marks of a disciple. But in the background, the song is playing, I have decided to follow Jesus. And there's no turning back because I want the marks of a disciple on my life. And if you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, hear the words that Jesus would say to you today. Where I'm going, you cannot come and you will die in your sin and you'll spend eternity apart from him. you trust Christ would you say I, I want to start by faith today Lord it's not the family I was born in I want to start by faith I want to trust you and you alone for my salvation if you're listening online today right where you are you can pray call out to God ask him to come into your life and save you As a believer today, as you're listening, would you just praise him, cry out, rejoice with him today that he forgives sin. And you're not going to die in your sin if you've trusted him.
And I want you to rejoice and praise with him. Praise him today that he's washed all your sin away. We pray these things in the wonderful, matchless name of Jesus. Amen.